Hello everyone. I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will talk about an approach to bleeding disorders. Bleeding disorders may be classified into either acquired or inherited. Let's discuss the acquired causes of bleeding disorders. These may be due to thrombocytopenias as seen in auto and autoimmune thrombocytopenias, drug induced hypersplenism, disseminated intravascular coagulation and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Acquired causes may also be because of liver disease such as cirrhosis and acute liver failure, vitamin K deficiency as is seen in malabsorption syndromes, hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, prolonged antibiotic therapy, malnutrition and prolonged biliary obstruction. Hematologic disorders such as acute leukemias, myelodysplastic syndromes, monoclonal gammopathies and essential thrombocythemia may also cause bleeding manifestations. The causes of bleeding disorders which are acquired are many in number and we continue with acquired antibodies against coagulation factors and this is seen in patients receiving factor 8 or 9 for hemophilias and there may be accelerated clearance of antibody factor complexes as seen in acquired von Willebrand's disease. Disseminated intravascular coagulation may be due to acute causes such as sepsis, malignancies, trauma and obstetric complications or chronic as seen in hemangiomas, malignancies and in abruptio placentae. Drugs such as antiplatelet agents, anticoagulants, antithrombins and nephrotoxic agents may all cause bleeding manifestations. Vascular causes such as non-palpable purpura, use of corticosteroids and vitamin C deficiency are also acquired causes of bleeding disorders. We will now move on to the inherited causes of bleeding disorders. These include deficiency of coagulation factors such as hemophilia A, B and deficiency of factors 2, 5, 7, 9 and 11 and von Willebrand's disease. Platelet disorders such as Glanzmann's thrombasthenia and Bernard Soulier disease along with platelet granule defects like the hermansky pudlak syndrome can also cause bleeding manifestations. Fibrinolytic disorders such as alpha-2 antiplasmin deficiency and deficiency of the plasminogen activator inhibitor can cause bleeding manifestations. Vascular causes which may be inherited are the hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias also known as osler weber rendu syndrome. We will now discuss the history that is to be taken in case of a bleeding disorder. This is a schematic diagram of a joint with the joint capsule shown in green, the bone, the cartilage and the soft tissue. If there is bleeding inside the joint, then we must always think of a bleeding disorder, specifically hemophilia, because hemophilias, both A and B, can present with hemarthrosis. Therefore, spontaneous joint bleed is always to be taken into consideration historically. When a patient experiences excessive bleeding during a dental extraction procedure, this history is significant as it may indicate that the patient has an underlying bleeding disorder. History of drugs and medications must always be taken because drugs like aspirin, warfarin and clopidogrel can cause bleeding manifestations. Furthermore, intake of herbal preparations can also cause bleeding disorders and their history must always be taken into account. Also important in a case of a bleeding disorder is nutritional history. In nutrition, we must always consider vitamin K deficiency, which may present with bleeding manifestations, vitamin C deficiency and general malnutrition or malabsorption. Family history is also important in a case of bleeding disorder and we must think of the inheritance pattern once we feel that there is a family history of bleeding. The inheritance pattern may be sex linked in which case it is hemophilia A and B. It may be autosomal dominant in which case it is von Willebrand's disease or it may be autosomal recessive in which case it is inherited coagulation factor deficiency or platelet deficiencies.
specifically von Willebrand's disease type 3 is autosomal recessive. Also important in history, while discussing or approaching a case of bleeding disorder is the pattern of bleeding. Now if the pattern of bleeding is localized, then we must consider a local cause such as a tumor or an angiodysplasia. However, if the pattern of bleeding is generalized in that the patient is having melina, hematuria, hemoptysis and recurrent nosebleeds, we can think of an underlying bleeding disorder. The patient may also have diseases which affect homeostasis such as cirrhosis of the liver which can cause bleeding manifestations. The patient may have defects or disorders of the bone marrow which can cause bleeding disorders. These include myeloproliferative neoplasms, myelodysplastic syndromes and acute leukemia. We move on to the clinical manifestations of bleeding disorders and these include epistaxis, oral mucosal bleeding, gingival hemorrhage, skin hemorrhage in the form of petechiae and ecchymosis and menorrhagia and postpartum hemorrhage. We have already discussed that a patient may have excessive bleeding during dental extractions and this may form part of the clinical manifestations. The patient may also have excessive bleeding during surgical procedures which should herald a search for a bleeding disorder. Also already discussed is the spontaneous joint bleeds which can be the presenting manifestation of hemophilia. This is a schematic diagram of a hair follicle. If there is hemorrhage around the hair follicle that is perifollicular bleed then we must specifically think of a vitamin C deficiency. We now move on to the lab evaluation of bleeding disorders and lab evaluation is done under three main headings. These include the prothrombin time which will be elevated, the activated partial thromboplastin time which will also be elevated and the platelet count which may be reduced. This along with whether or not the patient is having bleeding or not forms the basis of a clinical approach to bleeding disorders. Let us now move on to the clinical approach to bleeding disorders. We will take into account prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time and platelet count. In our first example or in a first set of possibilities, the prothrombin time is increased, the activated partial thromboplastin time is normal and the platelet count is normal. In such a scenario, the patient may be bleeding in which case it is severe factor 7 deficiency. The patient may not have any bleeding manifestations in which case it is mild factor 7 deficiency or the patient may be on oral anticoagulant medication. The next scenario is where the prothrombin time is normal but the activated partial thromboplastin time is increased along with a normal platelet count. It would be important to note here that the prothrombin time is affected by the function of the extrinsic pathway specifically factor 7 and APTT is affected by the function of the intrinsic pathway. In this scenario where APTT is increased but the other two parameters are normal, we can again classify the patients as those having bleeding and in this case it may be either injury related in which case it is because of severe factor 11 deficiency, mild to moderate hemophilia A or B or it may be spontaneous or unprovoked in which case it is minor or major and for minor bleeds it may be von Willebrand's and for major bleeds it is hemophilia A and B and severe type 3 von Willebrand's disease. So in a patient who is having an unprovoked major bleed with an increased APTT we must always think of hemophilia. Similarly a patient having a minor bleed which is unprovoked with a raised APTT we must think of von Willebrand's disease. If the patient is not bleeding then it could be deficiency of factor 12 high molecular weight kininogen lupus anticoagulant or the patient may be on heparin therapy. The third possibility is prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time is increased with a normal platelet count. Again we will classify the patients as those who are bleeding in which case it is a long list and the most important of these is a deficiency of factor 2, 5 and 10 
combined factor deficiency 5 and 8 and factor 10 deficiency in amyloidosis. Please keep in mind that acquired factor 10 deficiency in amyloidosis causes raccoon eyes. In a scenario where prothrombin time is increased and the APTT is also increased and the patient is not bleeding, then we may think of hypofibrinogenemia or a mild deficiency of factor 2, 5 or 10. Another scenario is where the prothrombin time is increased, the APTT is deranged and the platelet count is also low. This is a relatively ominous condition and in this situation whether or not the patient is bleeding, the cause is either disseminated intravascular coagulation, liver disease or lupus anticoagulant. With that, we have come to the end of this video, approach to a case of bleeding disorders. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.